Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to the channel. It is yours truly. It is Friday. It's the day for the paranormal podcast. Everybody's waiting for Fridays now. It is the 19th of March and we have a really good topic today. So this is for those of you that are brave enough to join the paranormal circle, right? So today we're doing a really good topic. It is based upon haunted female asylums <clears throat> women's asylums back in the day elfie shout out to elfie she did a lot um of our uh, oh we're supposed to be live on facebook says we're not sorry guys we're still working things out um elfie did all of our research for today so shout out to elfie thank you so much for helping us with research um kat and i have been wanting to do a stream about this for quite a while actually there's been uh you know history that we've researched in the past and we dug a little bit deeper probably about three or four weeks ago and when we were digging deeper we realized uh, it was a lot worse than we thought it was we knew that some women were being put away for various reasons um, it was a man's world back then so it's a very interesting stream to have a perspective from Kat and I so make sure that you get your tea because there's going to be some tea today, okay? It's going to be a good stream. Shout out to Laura. Thank you so much for your bits. I'm going to go ahead and bring in my co-host now. Holler to Kat Cormier. How are you, Miss Kat? Holla. I'm doing really well. How are you? <laughs> Holla. How was your week? How was, how was your week this week? It was kind of like dreary and gray. I mean, other than that, it's been great, but the weather's like been meh. Yeah, it's been uh, windy, gusty here. You know, it was gray. The last couple of days it's been better, but it's still got that, like, little bit of a chill. Mm -hmm. So I, But we had a really good work week this week, didn't we? Oh, lots done. Lots done. This was a great week, so I hope you guys had a great week as well because we had a kick-ass week, and it was a very good, productive week. Um, and I think we should probably start off the stream with... Uh, Oh, hang on a second. I'll be right back, guys. I'm going to put you on mute. There's some, I have a technical issue happening. Hang on. Okay, we're back. I think Kat's audio is down. I just switched out of Restream, as I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, and I moved back to Streamlabs, and it's a pain in the butt. This is the first stream we have set up, and it takes time to make sure everything's going correctly. Kat, do an audio check for me really quickly. Hello, hello. Mic check one, two. I think everybody should be able to hear you. Cat Cormier? I think so. Yeah. It was, I didn't have the right audio setting on. Thank God I have, uh, you know, Tech production support. staff on. Like, because I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on. My, my staff comes running and like, oh my God. Like, okay, I don't know. I'm like, hey. They're like, go to be right back screen. Mute the mic. I'm like, okay, I'll be doing it. Like, Oh my gosh, I, 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 I started seeing comments and I was like, okay, do I need to touch my set? I was like, wait, don't touch anything, it will burn to the ground. Everybody's okay? like don't panicked, I'm like, sorry. So yeah, we're back on Streamlabs. Cross your fingers, this works, that we can do some live streams. We're obviously, um, I'm trying to stream live to YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch all at the same time. And um, Restream just, I've been using it for like a year and it just, it's been unreliable for the past like three or four months and you you pay money for a service that should be working you know what i'm saying like <clears throat> you pay for yeah i mean twenty dollars a month for restream like i know it's not a lot of money but like you're paying for a service to be working and it's not working so yeah we switched to Streamlabs. so sorry we're having you know we're just going through the motions of getting everything under control but hopefully we're going to go now you know what i'm saying it's true anyways we had a good Can't week than my computer shutting down oh during a stream. <laughs> Salem came in, I'm like, fine, just dealing with a ghost. You're cool. like, hey, do you wanna like not mess with my electronics? Like that'd be really nice. Like I'm, I'm at work right now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I was like, no one mess with this. I'm saging the area before we stream so we don't have that issue. <laughs> now you have to sage on Fridays. Every night I have to sage. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Ooh, let's talk about Sage really quickly. Let's do it. Just really quickly, random topic, because we love tangents, you know. There's a thing going around on social media. Oh, somebody, Nikita said she loves your shirt. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we, there's a thing on social media that a lot of people, and I think I've addressed this once before, but people have been asking me to address it again. Um, there's a thing on social media that people are saying you should not use uh, white sage or sage unless you're Native American. Um, and, and people wanted to know what my opinion was on that. That's ridiculous, in my opinion, and I'm Native American. I've actually had dreams from my grandmother and my ancestors coming to me um, because I was asking for guidance from them on it because I was like, why are people getting upset about white sage? Like, they're claiming the sage is being harvested improperly and they're taking the sage from Native tribes. And, and I mean, if you're Native American out there and you don't like people using sage, okay, you're, you're entitled to have that opinion, but I'm also entitled to mine. And, the, and what my grandmother said, she came to me and said, I wasn't, I didn't serve, you know, our family didn't survive the trail of tears for you to be fighting about sage right now. You had a bigger purpose on this planet, so please don't fight about sage. So in other words, it, you know, my family was always had that like mentality of build a longer table, not a wall. So do you think you should take the right away from people to be saging and cleansing their energy and space? Absolutely not. Is it a native tradition? Yes. Should it be shared with people? Yes, it should. It's, it's a very good way of like shamanism and spirituality of cleansing space, cleansing energy. I think it's ridiculous. So if anybody's out there questioning if they should buy sage or not, please don't just buy the sage for God's sake. Like, <laughs> Jesus, like it's just ridiculous. And honestly, people are like, oh, they're, they're stealing sage from farm. That could be happening. But there's also sage farms in California. That's where my sage comes from, where they just grow sage. And they're like, oh, they stole it from the Native Americans. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. My, my Native family's rolling in their graves. They told me that. They're saying, I didn't survive the trail. It's yours for you to be fighting about sage right now. Go do something productive on this planet. Anyway, yeah, I, there's my I two mean, cents. And if you're feeling still weird about buying it, you can grow your own. True. You can grow your own right from home and, and do it that way. Right. You know? But, yeah, I... Find some I was Jesus really while you're at it. To hear Crystal's take on that. We've we had we've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. Well, and then I have people that are native that come at me that are like, "You're too white to have an opinion," and I'm like, "Dude, come on." You know, I hate that. I don't like that. You get that too with your Hispanic side. You're, you're half do. half Irish, half Hispanic, and people are like, "Oh, you're too white to have a, a Hispanic opinion," and you're like, "Excuse me." You're too white to be Mexican was the biggest one that I heard all the time. And I'm just like, okay. But yet you stand up for <laughs> your I heritage am. and you exactly. encourage and you, you promote and you give, you know, financially to your heritage. Mm -hmm. and, and I've obviously done a lot for Native American and especially women, you know, in the tribes. And I'm like, yeah, I hate those responses. And, and honestly, if you guys saw me with my natural hair color, you wouldn't recognize me. I go sun, stand in the sun for one day and I am like really like I look Native American straight up like literally like I tan within five seconds so does my mom we both have that like very olive undertone my mom has kind of darker skin for sure um and obviously my grandma was off the res so anyway long story short is beautiful. Jesus take the wheel I can't tan for my life <laughs> <laughs> I got I got definitely the Irish gene or I'm either white or red there's no in between <laughs> luckily I don't burn I just get tan like quick and that's when I was like, yeah, I don't go outside because I'm deathly afraid of, like, skin cancer because I went to cosmetology school. You know what I mean? So yeah. mm -hmm. my Native family is ashamed of me for that. They're like, Crystal, just go outside. Just go outside. And I'm like, no, not. Um, so anyway, that's my opinion. What do you think about Sage? I know you're not Native American, but you're one of my best friends, my co-host, producer. What do you think about the opinion of Sage? Um, I think it can go a little too far. Mm -hmm. I think, though, that having like a best friend that's Native American, it was still a conversation that I wanted to have mm -hmm. in order to not be disrespectful, you know? Um, but I, I found it really refreshing to hear that, you know, from Crystal's Native American side of the family that it's, it's everywhere, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I mean, Oh, and I still have family on the res. Everyone. I've called my family on the res, too. I've called, you know what I mean? Like, I've had actual mm -hmm. conversations with people that are on the res. And they're like, who started that? <laughs> like, literally <laughs> this, like, they're like, we don't care. Like, and I, and I, I, I But I was curious. Like, did it start from the res or did it start from, like, word of mouth? You know what I mean? I don't know. I, we've had to talk about this, too. 
especially <sighs> regarding like Hispanic culture as well, Mexican culture. And I feel that the only people that should be talking about it being an issue are the people of that culture. Sure. Not a random Joe Schmo. You know what right. I mean? That's all of a sudden making it an issue. Like mm -hmm. if you if you're concerned about something, take it up with the culture. Mm -hmm. Don't just spread misinformation to make everyone afraid. Well, you know, and I've seen people problem. online that are Native American that have said they have a problem with it. I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I think it's silly. Um, but they have that right to have that opinion. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. But it's an herb. And honestly, the herb belongs to Mother Earth, not any culture or persons, is my opinion. That's, then that, honestly, that ideology that I just spewed, saying it belongs to Mother Earth, that is the way it should be in native culture that is the way my grandmother raised me is you respect the land you respect the animals you respect the, everything from mother earth like that's who owns it so yeah anyway i'm done with my tangent i just <laughs> i don't have time to fight about sage that's the long story short here okay people it's true. and if you got a demon out. please jesus go buy some sage anyways we can move forward or you know uh same thing with my office. Just sage. Just, sage, you know. <laughs> just, just gonna cleanse the modem. Oh Please my god. Don't blow out again. It's okay, fine. so Kat and I had a really, really amazing, amazing productive week. And this is kind of the tea that I wanted to drop on everybody. So we are, as everyone knows, in pre production for um, the second pilot that we're planning on shooting. I am looking for some more people, so this is sort of like an official casting call, right? Like, you guys know I have my crew already. I have my post-production crew. I have camera tech. I have uh, well, multiple camera techs. I have, obviously, Kat with production. I have Elfie doing research. So I'm officially releasing another casting call. You don't have to apply per se, but I would love it even if you had suggestions of other people to shoot me an email that might be interested, right? Or like get word of mouth spreading. So here, here's what I'm looking for. Three people specifically, okay, is what I'm looking for. One, I'm looking for another researcher. Elfie does research with us, but we need a second researcher. I need somebody that's not afraid to go on camera and somebody that's not afraid to be sort of like, um, I would love to have someone with nerdy dweeby vibes that really goes by the book, bookworm, loves to research, likes, you know, obviously the side of like necromancy, which is, um, you know, communicating with the other side, um, witchy stuff, okay, you have to be into like all the occult stuff. So that's the first person I'm looking for. The second person I'm looking for is a replacement for Chanel. Chanel was our dark witch. Um, questions have come back if she's coming back. No, she will not be coming back. As we know, she had a mental health crisis, and Kat and I wanted her to put herself first, so that is what she is doing. So we need somebody to come forward that's more of a dark witch. Now, when I say dark witch, I don't want someone that's doing, like, spells and, like, putting spells against people and, like, you know, like, I just want someone that's very knowledgeable on the dark side of witchcraft, okay? Because when you go into certain locations, you never know what you're going to run into. And I need someone that's knowledgeable, maybe not, not necessarily practicing Satanism, okay, but knowledgeable on it. There's a distinct difference because I will not feel safe with you on my tour bus, okay? So that's the second person <laughs> that I would like, okay? <laughs> All right. Those things. Yeah. Okay. So first, a research nerdy person. Second, a dark witch. The last person I'm looking for, I need your help. I need everybody's help listening to me. If you've been a fan of GGD, I am calling on you for help. I am looking for a female engineer, a female Gary Gaka, a female, um, oh, what's his name, uh, from Colorado, Bill Chapel. Bill Chapel. I need a female engineer, someone that likes paranormal and the occult, really into science and, um, uh, you know, physics sort of side of things, understands how things are made, created, and built, and wants to be a part of this, okay? Now, the reason I'm calling on not just you guys, but you guys to be my army, if there is a YouTuber out there that I have missed, or somebody in the limelight that is a female engineer, I need you to send me their information. Okay, 
So if you know any of these people that you can talk to, start chatting in forums for me. Help me find these people. I need these elements, okay? If you need to, I want you to email me at crystal at ghostgirldiaries.com. Forward me their information or your information. I'd love to know like your background, like a little blurb on paranormal, which position you're sort of interested in, and I need a couple of headshots for you, from you guys because I'm, I'm ready to shoot the next pilot. We're getting there, okay? So a formal podcasting call. Um, I'm going by the image of, you know, chilling, chilling adventures of Sabrina meets the craft sort of image. So that's, you have to have an image, okay? You have to be into fashion. You have to be into beauty and makeup. You have to have that sort of edgy alternative image. That's what I'm looking for. And I know I'm looking for a needle in a haystack, but I'm hoping you guys out there, my fans always come through to help me. So even if you don't know somebody personally and you know of a YouTuber, send me their info or even an Instagrammer or somebody that you follow. Yep. Okay, that's my shmeal. Oh, I'm cool. done. I'm no. putting your email in the, um, like, type today. That's a mood. Okay. Chat. In the comments. Yay. Crystal at ghostgirldiaries.com. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to move on to some dark, dark history, which is great because, like, that's a mood. You know what I mean? It is a mood. I mean, oh, shoot, I think I accidentally <laughs> opened up the wrong, did I open up the wrong, no, I didn't open the wrong thing. Of course this document doesn't want to open, right? <laughs> of course it doesn't. That's what I get for not paying attention before we were done. There we go. Okay, let's start there. Okay. Streamlabs, man. I'm sorry. Streamlabs doesn't like me today. <laughs> Streamlabs, like, we're done with your shit, you know? Okay. So, what do we want to start on first? Um, I think, I think starting out with why women were put into asylums in, like, the 18th, 19th century is, like, mm -hmm. a good place to start. Right. Like, reasons why and who could bring them there. What like, was your, up. what was your inspiration behind, like, wanting to research this? My inspiration was a couple things. One, Women's History Month. Okay, right. first mm -hmm. one. Second one, finding out more information on the misogyny back in those days. Mm -hmm. Like, where it started from. Mm -hmm. And it's always been a thing, but I mean, that this was really prominent to the point where it's like, really silly, some of the reasons why these women would be thrown into a mental, mental asylum. I right. mean, scary. No, it's scary terrifying. It's terrifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I want to talk about some of the reasons why you may have been thrown into an asylum. So we're talking like 19th century. Now, Elfie did some really, really awesome, amazing notes for us. Um, and things like I didn't even realize about the asylum. But one of the things that I was interested in finding out was the timeline of asylums. They actually started in the UK. And then the UK was basically teaching people how to uh, tolerate women that were, quote, intolerable, right? Mm -hmm. And then the United States sort of took that inspiration and then they started building these, quote, asylums all over the place. So it was really interesting to find out the very first asylum for women's patients was built in 1773. And this was in Williamsburg, Virginia. The next one was in, which, you know, the middle of Virginia sounds so random to me. Like, back in that day, you're not going to have a lot of population. I feel like there'd be very little to no population in Virginia. So I'm wondering if they were thinking, okay, we're having an asylum here in the middle of nowhere because these patients, nobody wants to access them, right? Being I'm being raided. Exactly. Hi, raid. Oh, yes. We're being raided. Thanks for the raid. I'm being raided. Yas. Thank you guys for raiding my stream. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I wasn't even looking over at my screen with that. Um, <laughs> don't look when I'm talking about a paranormal topic. Okay. I'm going to dive in head first and I like talking about dark shit. Okay. So welcome to the Raiders. Thank you for being here. We're talking about haunted asylums today. Haunted women's asylums. Okay, so back to, um, so anyway, 1773, random Williamsburg, Virginia. So the only thing I could think of is they put it in the middle of nowhere so that no one could be accessed. You know what I mean? Like, oh, we're going we're gonna to dump a bunch of people in this asylum in the middle of nowhere 
so that nobody can access them or if we have a patient escape they literally just like die in the middle of nowhere so like they thought this stuff through and think about 1773 you're still talking like covered wagon travel yep mm-hmm some shady shit was going on for sure. <laughs> the way I mean, said. I'm just saying, okay? Now, why would you build a building in the middle of nowhere? I, literally. And it was quite large if you look it up. I mean, for that time, it was a two-story building. It kind of looks like a wannabe church, so it makes you wonder. Um, it was titled Rebuilt the Public Hospital for Persons of Insanity and um, Disordered Minds. Oh, that's cute. That's a mood. Um, 1841, Boston school teacher Dorothea, um, this girl Dorothea Dix is a huge person involved with the lawmakers and treatment of, of people and women in psychiatric hospitals. We're going to dip into her more later. I didn't even know this bitch existed. And she's like yeah. a huge, in my opinion, I mean, considering she was trying to save these people out of these psych psychiatric hospitals and she literally on her deathbed was still trying to save people on, out of these psychiatric hospitals and it's yeah, just she, crazy she's really inspirational honestly and she was one like bad bitch like she got she worked her way up she worked hard and yeah we'll dive into that for sure yeah we'll dive into that later but i wanted to give you yeah. guys a timeline of when um psychiatric hospitals started so around 1773 as we said Moving on, another big one opens in 1907, which is Indiana, and now we're in about 30 states altogether. There's now a psych ward, okay? So now men were in psychiatric hospitals, but would you say an accurate statistic is about one-third men to two-thirds women? Very accurate. Because we were reading statistics on this, because we were like, it, it was mainly labeled women's, you know, hospitals, but was it really just for women? Or was it for more than women? Because, like, you know, no offense, but mental health exists for everybody. So why are, why are we labeling them women's psychiatric hospitals? So men were placed in them, and, and honestly, I think men were placed in them probably for the right reasons. Like, if they were having severe yeah. mental breakdowns or syphilis was really big back then before, like, penicillin and other medications were invented. And what syphilis would do, oftentimes syphilis was spread due to prostitution, unsafe sex, and it would make you literally go crazy. You'd literally go yeah. crazy. And they didn't know what to do with it, so they would you'd go, be going crazy and you'd end up just dying in the hospital because they didn't have medications invented yet. Um, they would, you know, we're, we're going to get into like the, the weird, uh, lobotomies and like dark shit that they performed on people later. But first, you know, Kat and I are sitting here like, okay, this is when, you know, you guys know how Kat and I are with topics except with women's topics, right? Women's haunted paranormal. We're like, oh my God, I'm going to go in and do it. You know, like, <laughs> so what did we do? We're like taking it apart. You know what I mean? We're like, we're really getting into it. Cause like we, you and I both cat, right? Didn't have a clue how bad this system was. No, I mean, I feel like we had like a little inkling, but we were on the phone for like, what like two three hours on separate days literally yeah yeah and and we were just like oh my god this okay is so bad it's okay this i don't even know how to like word this because there's really no appropriate way to word this so i'm just gonna like spit it out you know what i'm saying okay. but okay so men probably were we're talking 1700s right like so men were probably put in the hospitals if they were having a severe mental health crisis right like Maybe at this time, they don't really know what bipolar is. They probably don't know what schizophrenia and multiple personality is. Um, depression is not really being, um, you know, diagnosed or um, a thing then. They just called you insane is sort of the title. There weren't like all of the mental health branches that we have today. So they would just literally stick you in there. So that was for a man, right? So a man is having a crisis. He's going into the hospital for whatever reasons. Oh, that's not the same as a woman, okay? No. So let's chat about why women were placed in hospitals. This is sick. So, like, I'm just going to give you guys a warning. There's some uh, discretion here of 
some dark things that happened with these women and why they were placed there. So if you are uh, an easy stomach, we're not going to go into gruesome details. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do gruesome details, but I am going to tell you guys some of the things that they were, we, they were placed in for. And uh, the list goes on and on, by the way. I don't think Kat and I are even going to be able to cover everything at this point. No, if you were a woman during that time, if you breathed, you were an issue. Yeah, if you were breathing wrong, you could be put in. I'm not kidding. If you were breathing incorrectly and your husband didn't like what you were doing, he could place you in an asylum. Women were considered property at the time. They were not considered. And I I would say that they be when asylums first became a thing, they were probably placed there for like good measure. But I think over time, the system, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, became abused by spouses. I think men abused the system. If a man yeah. wanted a divorce, he could just, because divorce was frowned upon then, he could just place his wife in a psychiatric hospital, take the land and everything they owned together from her, throw away the key, and then he could go on and marry somebody else. If he was having an affair, yeah. rather than being caught with the affair, he would just he, ha he was fully capable of saying, oh, my wife's crazy for whatever reason, throw her in the asylum, move on to the next woman. And no there were that. there were men that did that. There were men that would be like, oh, she's, I need to get rid of her. Like, this one's not going to work either. Put her in the asylum. Let's find another woman. And it's, it's crazy because then what would happen, the, the mistreatment of these women going into the asylums, which is why are they haunted? Because of the mistreatment that went on for so many years. And we'll, yeah. we'll get to that too. So some of the reasons a woman would be um, put in an asylum for. If she smoked or chewed tobacco and her husband f caught her, she would be thrown in an asylum because he found that um, as like a dirty trait and it wasn't feminine. So he could claim her as mentally ill and put her in asylum. This is one that shocked me, and this is this is one of the discretion ones because it's like, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. You know what I mean? I don't know how to be proper. <laughs> you, there's no proper way. Um, if you, uh, okay, I have, I have a way to say it. If you, uh, as a woman, if you were doing something that was regarding self-pleasure in the bedroom, that's, that's proper, isn't okay, it? Okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> yeah. If you were doing self-pleasure in the bedroom and your husband, well. and your, hu your husband caught you, he could say, I don't like it that she's not allowing me to please her. She's going to an asylum because she's mentally ill. And he would, they would minimally, minimal, minimum amount of years for self-pleasure was 30 years in yeah. an asylum. You can be dead by then. Oh, yeah. Or actually go insane. <sighs> um, okay, so there's one. Laziness. If you were a wife and you didn't want to, like, clean up after your husband because he's a pig or, or maybe you're just tired... Maybe you feel suppressed in a society that's not for women. Oh, asylum. You're lazy. You're crazy. Something's wrong with you, boo. Asylum. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Overtaxing mental powers. That was an interesting. Such as, I mean, basically, basically what that means is your husband thinks that you're very powerfully mentally strong. Like you're, like you're a feminist. You're a strong woman. Oh, Oh, we got to put her in the asylum. She's not listening. We got to put her. We got to lock her up. Got to put her You're away. Probably there. I was. I was already there. <laughs> Oops. I told Kat. I was like, if I if I lived in the 1700s, I would have either been in the asylum for not minding my husband, or I would have been a prostitute because that would have been the only form of an entrepreneur. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, did you hear what I said? What? I was like, or burned. Or, uh, like no, that was the life before that. That was the yeah, life before that. That was, that was the last one. Yeah, that was the time yeah. before that. That was a whack. That was a whack. If you were a yeah. woman that was interested in studying, such as you had an interest in film, you had an interest in literature, you had an interest in creative writing. Oh, she's getting too smart. We got to throw her in the asylum. Oh, she can't get smart. We got to throw her in the asylum. Oh, here's a good one. If your husband doesn't enjoy your company, and he generally just thinks you're a bad person, asylum. You know, uh, I feel like at that point, women might have been strong enough to think of it as like an out from that psycho house. 
Maybe the house was the asylum. True. Very Think true. About it. Yeah. You know. Um, if you had any opinions on political figures that were going on in your time, you weren't allowed, as a woman, you weren't allowed to speak out politically. Asylum. Asylum. Oh, she's crazy. She's opinionated. We got to get rid of her. Uh, now, this one's a little, this one kind of makes sense to me, honestly. If you, if you married incest, you'd go to the asylum. I mean, okay. Like, I'll let that one go. You know what I mean? I feel like that's like jail time, too. No. I, f- I feel like, like now. I feel like rather than an asylum, maybe they just need to send you to church and like pray to Jesus and like just let's not you know <laughs> please they need something. They need something, but I maybe. would give her a King Tut book and say, Have you ever studied King Tut and know what happens with King Tut? Okay. He was inbred and he had a lot of issues. That, that whole family man was <laughs> that's for another stream with my Egypt. Yeah, let's my not Egypt tangent. Yeah, let's not tangent, you know, because we could. Like, I could go there, you know what I mean? But I'm not. It's fun to tangent. It's Uh, fun, but not. That's a tangent. Like, that. (laughs) That's a lot. That would be like a five hour stream of, like, the dysfunctionalism of Egypt when it was, like, trying to create an empire. Like, of course, that's not just Egypt. A lot of royal families would keep their blood in line of, like, sleeping with their kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. All I'm going to say is this life. I discovered how to mummify someone at age 11 and oh would have been thrown into an asylum. Oh my God. All I'm gonna say God okay. Jesus, Lord. Sometimes you just got to know. Sometimes you just got to know. So On that note, video. I think we should just end that because it could keep going. <laughs> all right. The one that I found interesting was hard study. Mm-hmm. They called it hard study. And it was the fear of women knowing things and, like, them women knowing that they don't need men anymore. Right, that's a mood. Like, self-empowerment. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're like... Well, yeah, but doesn't that tie into, like, women becoming witches and joining covens, which was also, like, empowering, and they tried to stop that shit? Yeah. hmm So it's the same thing. They don't want you to be powerful. Once again, what was that thing you saw on Instagram? It said, um, thank God women want equality and not revenge. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Lord. It's true. I mean, it's going to happen with some generation at some point. What, revenge? You <laughs> said that. I think you said that, like, when we were talking. I recently. did say that. Yeah, it's going to happen at some point, but... Well... In the meantime... In the meantime, I'm just going with the flow. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When the revolution happens, call me. Um, su- <laughs> superstitions, which, I mean, I feel like everybody has superstitions. You know what I mean? Like, I have... I, I've talked about this before. I've never really gone into in-depth about it, but I, I used to be obsessed with, um, like like antique keys you know like really pretty antique keys yes they're like skeleton and Mm -hmm. i used to i used to have like literally probably 20 or 30 necklaces of skeleton keys and the day maybe i'll just talk about it the day i lost i lost one key one day and the day i lost the key my car got stolen and after that i associated skeleton keys with bad juju yeah, and the fairy took it. Well, I had other I had a couple other things happen when I lost a skeleton. Like it wasn't that bad obviously. They found my car. It was totally wrecked and trashed. But like after that I was like stay away from skeleton keys. Those are really bad for Crystal. Like she doesn't need those. So, but if you had a superstition, asylum. Go on, throw you in there. You don't we don't want you with your superstitions. Um I mean there's way more. Period. Too bad. <sighs> Um, I found this really interesting article by this girl named Catherine uh, Puba is her name, P-O-U-B-A, um, and Ashley Tyen is their name, so if you look it up. Um, they did this like really big abstract article on uh, studying uh, asylums between the years 1850 and 1900, and I just want to read a couple of short lines. Women were placed in mental institutions for behaving in ways that male society did not agree with. Women during this period had minimal rights, even con- even concerning their own mental health rights. Research concluded that many women were admitted for reasons that could not be questioned. Um, and, and a lot of those women that were admitted were obviously abused. And it's just really tragic. And mm-hmm. um, women were faced with things like abnormal body functions or actions, like anything that you did strange. So if your elbow, if you had like a double joint, you could be thrown in an asylum. I mean, like, literally anything. Um, postpartum, 
if you had postpartum depression, they didn't call it postpartum then, they could throw you in the asylum. Um, I, there's, in this article I have in front of me, I'm on page three. It's there, an awesome article. It's, an, it's only 10 pages, so it's not really long if you want to look it up. It's called uh, Lunacy in the 19th Century Women's Admissions and Asylums in America. On the you want me to put it in the comments? Yeah, you can. Link it. Um, on the yeah. third page, it talks about several things that people were pla- well, women were placed in the asylum for. So majorly, there were domestic problems. There was one person that was, rep- that was placed in the asylum for unknown causes, um, being, feeling suppressed, religious fantasies, religious matters, Overexertion, so being too excited could have also put you in the asylum. Oh God. Um, let's see. One one woman had an abortion, and she was placed in the asylum for having an abortion. Uh. uh loss uh. of property, uh, mental excitement. So I'm assuming that could be more related to uh, enjoying reading or studying or whatever. Um, insane by overwork and domestic trouble. So if if your husband thinks you're working too much and you're not being a housewife enough, we're going to throw you in the asylum. Um, childbirth and also nymphomania. So if you wanted to sleep with your your husband too much, he would throw you in the asylum. And that's not everything. There's there's a lot of other reasons, but that's the, that's the topics that Kat and I sort of pulled out for being the most disruptive, I think. Um yeah. I think what was also really sad was when we were going through these lists, and there were a lot of them, of just like, you know, the age, 39, 40, 30, 40, 22, like these age, they're not that old. Like these women that are going in aren't that old. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them even said... One was 17. Yeah, yeah. Um, There were a lot of them that were written down as insane by unknown cause. Mm Mm-hmm. And to me, like, that just immediately read because there was no reason. Mm-hmm. There was no reason for them to be in there. So it's just horrible to keep seeing that. Insane by unknown cause. Insane by unknown mm-hmm. cause. It's just chilling. It's it's tragic. And they, you know, their families. So once you're in an asylum, your families could come and take you out. Like, if their parents or their families wanted to take them out. But that was such a shun to society back then. They didn't want anybody to know their daughter was in an asylum. So they, they just left you there. Imagine, like, cell phones don't exist. You, you can't. And now, not only that, but now you've become a, a guinea pig. Yeah. Now they're doing lobotomies. They're throwing medicine at you that you don't know what it is. It's making you weak, tired, dizzy out of it. They're doing experimental surgeries on you. And, and we wonder why these places are haunted. Another reason I wanted to do this topic was I have seen only men investigators because, as we know, the sa- the the market's saturated with only men investigators. What like ninety five percent male? Pretty much, if and, not more. If not more, and these men are going into places like asylums, and they're you know either they're looking for a demon or like oh where's the dark energy harboring everything here. The, the asylum is the dark energy. The asylum is the demon. Like, the location's the demon. It's not, it's not a thing. It's not a person you're looking for. It's a thing. It, it's, it's the location. It's trapped them. And imagine if you died while, you know, you've been placed there by your family. You feel lonely, depressed. It talks about they would put you in padded rooms. They would put you in straitjackets, just leave you there for days. With no human interaction, no love, you would go insane. You would go insane even if you weren't insane. And that doesn't count all of the drugs, the anesthesia, the surgical procedures. So imagine they're doing these these procedures on people, these experiment they're guinea pigs. It's an experimental lab. And you're under medication, you're you're being surgically worked on, and now you die. Would you know that you're dead? Oh gosh, no. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'd be stuck. Oh, I'd Honestly. be stuck. I'd be confused. I'd be like, where? What? what's going on? Where am I? Well, your whole reality is totally warped to believe something that you're not. That's, that's a mind trip of its own without the drugs and everything else, mm-hmm. you know? And you're surrounded by some that might have some legitimate, you know, mental health crises going on. Um, but a majority of them weren't. 
You know? So then how do you feel about these male investigators going in handling it this way rather than being compassionate and empathetic towards the energies that are there and the suffering that took place? Instead, they're looking for a demon or they're looking for the dark thing that's harboring them there. How do you feel about that? I think, one, it's disrespectful. And I think, two, they would, it's expected that something dark or, you know, something is going to attack them. Because if it were me as a female, you know, that had passed on being put in a mental asylum that, you know, I wasn't meant to be in, and there are guys in this day and age that are doing the same shit that caused me to go in there back in the 1800s, I'm going to have some issues with them. Right. They're, they're interrogating these people. Mm-hmm these spirits you know i mean absolutely just not warranted and i'm also i'm also not saying to go into a location not being uh you never want to go into a location just open yourself up you know what i mean like you do need to be prepared because there could be something dark there um in my likelihood though of all the investigations i've done and all the places i've been you're more likely to run into energies attached to the location versus like a demon. And I've said that for years. And especially if you're taught, like, and honestly, in these asylums, when we've seen people go investigate, they're like, oh, there's got to be a demon or a dark shadow figure that's harboring the energies there. Have you ever considered maybe the dark energy was the doctors and nurses? Yep. Allowing it to go on. And doing the torturing? How could they sleep at night? Well, a lot of these places had underground tunnels, and I know we've seen some of those on TV. You know, never, nobody ever talks about the underground tunnels. The only thing they say is, oh, well, they had to use the tunnels because in the winter it was too cold to, to wheel the body outside to the morgue, so we had to tunnel to the morgue. Yes, that's partially true. But the other reason they had the tunnels, and you can research this on your own, is there were so many people being worked on as guinea pigs and dying that they couldn't report how many bodies that there were coming out a day. So the way they hid the bodies was by rolling them through the tunnels. Why are the tunnels so haunted? Once again, we're going down in the tunnels, as we've seen on all of the shows. They're looking for a dark energy in the tunnels. How do you know it's a dark energy? How do you know if it's just not like the doctor that rolled them down or the nurse or maybe it's the patients that are stuck in those tunnels? Oh my gosh. I feel like there's a, they're missing the opportunity to communicate though, don't you think? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a lot deeper than, you know, what's on the surface, you know, based off of everything going on. Mm -hmm. And I, who's to say that female patients weren't being like raped in those tunnels oh they were oh i'm sure who's to say that you know like that what's the what's the thing where you have you sleep with a dead body necro not necrophilia Uh, is that right i think that's it yeah i always get necromancy and necrophilia mixed up i'm like there's a difference just be careful when you say (laughs) that (laughs) one's a summon and one's not That was so funny. Oh, my God. Because it's true. Because every time I say it, I'm like, oh, God, did I say the right word? I hope so. Okay, It's because it's the same beginning. One's really bad, and one's not as bad. You know what I mean? (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> like there's a difference there's oh a my gosh, big God. difference not even i know what oh. why are those words so like they shouldn't be whoever created those words made a huge mistake like clearly you change it okay you gotta change that <sighs> time. jesus lord yeah the um something that really stuck out to me in the notes as well was who could admit these like women into the asylums mm-hmm. and it was decided by your husband mm-hmm. a brother mm-hmm. of any side of the family or a male friend. Mm-hmm. So like, proving once up. again, like, society's anybody, ran by the males. Some random guy could take some random girl off the street and roll him in to an asylum and just say, here you go. How messed up is that? I, I literally have no words. Like, I feel like, you know, I, and that's the, the difference of why I'm so frustrated why there hasn't been women in paranormal. Because I I feel like, especially us, like, we're intuitive, we're empaths. Like, I mean, I don't like to use the word psychic. Because, yeah, we've gotten visions before, Kat and I both have. But, like, I don't think I'm psychic enough to call myself a psychic. You know what I mean? Like, I'll get those visions, I'll get those things happen. I'm much more comfortable with the term intuitive or empath. Um, But going into one of those places as a female, I don't think I would be investigating or reacting the same way that we've seen on TV. I think I would feel a serious heaviness, and I think I would feel the sort of like pain and torment those patients went through, whether it's mental, physical, or even emotional. Sadness. 
such a sadness, such mm. sadness. Really heavy, really heavy. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes those emotions can translate without even saying anything. True. They really can. Mm -hmm. You know, so if your intentions are good, going into location like that, especially as a female, mm -hmm. I just feel like they just know. They well, know? it would also be interesting. I feel I personally just opinionated on going into like a female abandoned asylum. Mm -hmm. I do think obviously the doctors, nurses, medical staff was doing corrupt things. I do think no matter who you are, whether you're just a corrupt doctor or you're um, Richard Ramirez, I mm -hmm. think that you know if you meet your maker, you're going to have a really big problem. And I think they're afraid to, to cross over because they don't want to meet their maker for what they've done, like all the torment. And, and their karma is going to come back whether it's one way or another. You know what I mean? Yep. So it would be interesting to go in those places as strong women because I don't think those doctors would like it that have stayed around or the medical staff. And I do think no. you would be prone to attacks because they see you as a strong woman is what they're against. They're still stuck in that loop of that same time period, whether it's 17, 1800s. And I think there would be a lot of evidence and attacks happening because you're what they want. They want you as another guinea pig. They want you as another experiment. You're in the flesh and you're what they want. Yeah, it's true. I, I agree with that 100%. And of course, there's still going to be some form of aggression from those male doctors because they're still in denial, clearly, mm -hmm. that they did anything wrong when a part of them knows they did. Well, I mean, that was stuff. dark. I mean, they, I, I feel like even, like, you even have Richard Ramirez, it's like, oh, yeah, I know I did bad things. I have no remorse for it. Like, so when you're doing dark things, even using people as experiments on a scientific level, you still know you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so, like, whether they're stuck in the gray zone or not, they know why they're there and they know what they did when they were alive. Yeah. So, and it's interesting. It's just into the whole thing's very, very interesting. Um, what direction do you want to take this in next? Um, let's see here. Talking about um, labeling women as insane was done very lightly, um, and with influences by social attitudes towards women. Um, there were lots of questions being posed in a lot of these articles, just to get like outside input, saying. Mm -hmm. Did these women truly need to be admitted to the asylums or was their admittance an example of their lack of power and control in their lives? Because women had no control. Mm -hmm. um, Around 1938 the, oh. is when they started, uh, there was a neurologist that mm -hmm. I can't pronounce his name. Ugo was his first name, UGO. Mm -hmm. He was the one that um, introduced, oh, he's an Italian. He's an Italian neurologist in 1938. He introduced electroshock therapy as a treatment for patients with schizophrenia and chronic illnesses electroshock therapy um and obviously we know today that it does they they do still do it to an extent but it's not done the raw way where you actually like felt pain and they were there they still do do it if you like check into the mayo clinic for certain like mental health treatments but it's mm -hmm. done a completely different way in this modern day and age but even if you were would come out of the closet and say I'm a lesbian or I'm gay, they would try to treat you with electroshock therapy. Oh gosh, yeah. Mm -mm. That was another nope. reason you could be thrown in the asylum was coming out saying I'm LGBT. Yeah, I found it really interesting too because they were going on in some of these articles, uh, you know, the research of these mental asylums, and they found it really interesting the comparison of rates of admittance with people that were American born and those that were immigrant women. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, horrible, horrible stuff. Just throw them away and lock away the key. Nobody cares. Oh, it's messed up. So, and in go ahead. one of the statistics, um, in 1879, they found some records. And it was really difficult to see how many males to females were in some of these asylums. Like, it was really difficult to point that out and, and find that information. And it was probably because they didn't want it on paper yeah oh i think and, so and, many and, records were hidden for sure 100 yeah because it was wrong mm -hmm. and um there was an example um in middlesex county asylum in hanwell housed eight or 728 males mm -hmm. in contrast to 1098 females mm -hmm. so once again about a third of the population yeah um, 1955, so that's really not that long ago, honestly, if you think about it, you know, because we were talking about the um, 1700s before, 
So you're talking about 1955, the number of people that were in psychiatric hospitals was 560,000 people. Where's the balance, though? Because I feel like you have, you have this extreme side where it's like, oh, everybody's going in the asylum for something. Kat and I are feminists. The asylum. Like, we would have been there a long time ago. You know what I mean? And uh, gladly. We probably form an alliance. Oh, yeah. Let's, well, that's <laughs> what's crazy, too, is, like, there's all these people in there who aren't sick and they were afraid to fight back. That's amazing. And the, and the state didn't care. Nobody was there to help them. It's just shocking, the, the torture that went on. But, mm -hmm. um... But, but anyway, with that being said, too, it's just, um, I lost my train of thought. You know what I mean? Well, I think what was crazy about that, too, was also these women, like all of them, were just being drugged upon arrival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't even, they weren't even really given a chance to think about their circumstances. And sometimes I wonder if that was a saving grace in two away. Well, I got, here's another thing that's interesting is 1965 is when they started like the Medicare program, Medicaid program for patients. So if you had sickness, illness, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Disabilities, mm -hmm. they would mm -hmm. place you on this and then they would stick you in an asylum. It makes you like clearly they would take their checks or medical insurance, which was funding these places. So that now it's become even more corrupt. Oh, yeah. Even it, it more was corrupt. essentially a witch hunt. It's just shocking. It's just, and it just got weirder and weirder. But once again, the balance is you have these crazy asylums where people, some people, I would say a majority of people that shouldn't have been there. But now you have this day and age where we're finally making mental health a topic of conversation because everybody knows I'm pro mental health um, conversation. I think that the way to bring it into society is to talk about it more freely and openly. And I've dealt with friends and family that have had severe mental health crisis. But now you have a day and age where there's no help. None. Mm -hmm. Where's the balance, man? Now you have a lot that. of people and homeless on the street that actually do need treatment and do need help and can't live in society like a normal person. But they won't make asylums or and maybe we don't need to call them asylums because I think that because asylum the term means crazy person, you know? But we do need facilities to help these people obtain not being abused by the system and doctors and nurses, but where they can get the proper treatment that they need. There's no balance. Why is it this extreme or this or nothing? Like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get, I don't get our no society. Basic, no, it's not sick. It was sick. And there was no basic mental health facility. Mm -hmm. None. None. It was just totally extreme. Totally extreme. Um, so I want to compare a haunted asylum to a modern day and age asylum. Let's do it. I know, Kat, have you been to a, uh, an abandoned asylum at all? Yep, right here in Concord, actually. Okay, it's I've been to a, a I've been to a few in Colorado that are abandoned. Um, <clears throat> Kat and I have been to an, uh, a modern day and age active, I don't want to call it asylum, mental health facility. Mm -hmm. Kat was with me when we went. Um, I'm not, we're not going to give the backstory because it's personal and private. We went, she went as like support to um, help me with somebody. Okay. I can say that the feelings and vibes and the energy rolling in an active day and a mental hospital is probably calmer than an abandoned one because patients aren't being abused and mistreated. Mm -hmm. However, it still has that anxiety feeling right fear of and I'm talking energy we're talking energy reading how did you how do you feel about it yeah I would have to say that I mean there's still activity going on paranormal activity that happens um, <laughs> yeah, I had a rough ex that was crazy okay that was wild um <laughs> but it's fine everything's fine um but yeah it's definitely different now than what it was then I'm sure right no, I, if you're I in agree. A more controlled environment mm -hmm. where where steps are needed to be taken to get you to where you need to be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, thank God. But it shouldn't have gotten to that extreme for that to happen. Well, once again, I, I feel like why do we, once again, extremes? Mm -hmm. Everybody's in the asylum or we have no access to mental health help. What the hell, man? Yeah. Every, like, I'm not going to lie and say I haven't had depression. I've had issues with mental health. That's just, it's called being human and this planet is hard. Is what it's called. Therapy. 
therapy works. Yeah. I mean, I've, mm-hmm. yeah, I've done that too multiple times. That's why I'm not ashamed to talk about mental health because we lived in a time for so long where society shamed it and it shouldn't be shamed, especially coming out of a damn pandemic for a year where we're all, you know, been isolated and it's okay to say I need help. You know what I mean? Like, it's okay to say like, wow, that was rough. Um, I don't even know how I'm going to human. I'm supposed to go meet a friend for dinner tonight at an outdoor restaurant that's social distancing. And I haven't been to a restaurant in a year because our, our numbers have dropped significantly. Of course, I'm going to wear my mask and be safe. But I'm sitting here like, how do you human again? I don't know how to do this. I don't know. Re- how do I go to a restaurant? I don't know what that means. Can somebody <laughs> teach me? I'm glad the numbers are going down, though. There's some hope that's coming, guys. Oh, my, hope. my God. I can't wait for a vacation. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. Oh my god. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll be fun. Go crystal shopping in Utah. Do you want to um, talk about Dorothea? Yeah, one last thing I'd like to do is a just one more statistic. of t- you mm-hmm. know, 2004 statistic is studies suggest that there's 16% of prison and jail inmates that have actual mental illness, which is roughly around 320,000 people. Now, once again, that statistic was from 2004. There's only 100,000 psychiatric beds in where you can access mental health. So what do you, what do the 220,000 other people do? Yeah. Why are we, ha- once again, if people are having mental health crises and being put in prisons, that's how haunted prisons happen. So they're basically saying that prisons are now serving as basically modern day psychiatric wards. Mm-hmm. So we shouldn't be locking these people up. We should be getting them treatment and help. And instead, as a society, we're like, oh, let's not talk about mental health. Like, that's not good. You know, let's just don't talk about it. Yeah, I think it's also really sad that a large majority, if not most of them, um, these patients that ended up passing away um, were put into grave slots that just had a number on it. That's true, too. Well, another I, six statistic, statistic, hello, I can't talk, since from 2010, there are, f- current day and age, there are 14 beds for every 100,000 people that have a psychiatric breakdown. So we're still we're still ignoring it. Yep. What's it gonna take, man? Like literally, you know, like the system screwed. The system screwed. The whole system. We don't we don't learn from history. It just continues to repeat itself until we just don't exist anymore. And it's just so bizarre. Now I shouldn't get to that extreme. I'm gonna let you take over a little bit with Dorothea. I have your notes in front of me, but you're the one that really researched her. Mm-hmm. So going back, if you guys remember at the beginning of the stream, there was someone called Dorothea Dix, and she was sort of this really big advocate for people that were in psychiatric wards. Yes, predominantly women, but also men that were being thrown in the wards that shouldn't have been. And she was basically saying, you know, this is inhumane to just throw away the key and put these people in and, and let them be guinea pigs. And essentially they just rot away. So go ahead, Kat. Go ahead and start with her. Yeah. She's an amazing soul. So early 19th century she was an early 19th century activist who pretty much changed the whole medical field during her lifetime um and she's championed um causes for both the mentally ill and indigenous populations so Mm -hmm. she was very inclusive uh very before her time and um you know by doing this work she openly challenged a lot of 19th century notions of reform and illness and Mm -hmm. mental illness so um she had been in conversations with a lot of physicians trying to figure out the root of this and how can we do this better Mm -hmm. and um Dix ended up helping recruit nurses for the Union Army during the Civil War. Yeah, that's interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and she transformed the field of nursing with that. Hmm. I mean, that's that is huge. Mm -hmm. So, Dix, uh, Dorothea was born in um, Hampton, Maine, Mm -hmm. uh, in 1802, which is just like two hours from me. Holla, Uh, little little's really known about her childhood there's just more history based on the um, activist lifestyle she had as she grew up and um, historians believe that her parents suffered from alcoholism and her father was abusive so she had a rough childhood that's pretty much the extent of it um, that they could find but because of this abuse at a young age she ended up moving to Boston to stay with her grandmother so she was brought up by um, a different family member and she attended school in Boston and actually tutored children, so she worked with kids a lot. And 
while she was working with children, she became ill a lot. Um, she, she was sick all the time and um, essentially was forced to stop teaching at that point. And during one of her bouts of illness, her physicians had suggested that she spend some time in Europe. And while she was visiting overseas, she ended up meeting with a group of reformers that were interested in changing the way um, the mentally ill were being cared for in these institutions. So that's really what sparked uh, everything. You know, talk about divine timing. She you know, basically she had, had a drive from seeing how these people were suffering. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I hope anyone would. Mm -hmm. I, it shouldn't have taken it even until the 1900s for this to happen. Yeah, that's know? a long time. That's a 200-year that's period of some serious suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really sad. Um, so once she, Dorothea, returned to the United States, she set um, out to tour mental hospitals around the country to start asking some of these difficult questions. And you can only imagine how that must have been dealt with as a woman, you know. Mm -hmm. So... Um, she pushed states to care for the unfortunate, try to get them more care, and there were a lot of politicians that disagreed with her work and as she moved forward, but that didn't stop her. Um, she eventually did end up establishing asylums in New Jersey, um, North Carolina, and Illinois, mm -hmm. and she worked to pass a federal legislation that would create a national asylum. Um, you know, and though the bill didn't pass, um, she did tour overseas again, though, reporting that conditions um, of the hospitals in various countries were still continuing. So she was doing, like, research work comparing over there to here, um, which I found really interesting because you didn't see any men doing that. Okay, is all I'm going to say about that. Um, <laughs> oh. Kat's like, I'm just going to get this in real quick. <laughs> okay, just gonna a little drop, a little Aries moment in there. Um, <laughs> Dorothea was also known for treating both um, Confederate and Union soldiers, um, which really gained her a lot of respect in the nursing field. Mm -hmm. And um, during that period when male doctors were openly expressing disdain for female nurses, um, Dorothea continued to pull for formal training um, and more opportunities for women nurses. So mm -hmm. she was a feminist of her time, mm -hmm. absolutely. And over the course of the war, she ended up appointing more than 3,000, or about 15% of, um, you know, Union Army nurses. Wow. So, really amazing. And she ended up stepping down from the position around 1865. Mm -hmm. And after that, her work didn't stop, though. Um, Dorothea ended up raising funds for a building of um, a national monument to honor deceased soldiers. So, a uh, monument for veterans, passed on veterans, um, which stands at Fort Monroe in Virginia today. So, you can go and check that out there. Hmm. Wow. And um, after that, she did continue fighting for social reform throughout her life. And um, her work in support of better care for the mentally ill culminated into restructuring of many hospitals, both in the United States and abroad. So she had massive, um, you know, help with uh, restructuring the whole facilities together, you know. And um, after she suffered from a really bad illness, Dorothea ended up returning back to New Jersey. Um, where she spent the remainder of her life in a specially designed suite um, in the New Jersey State Hospital. And she ended up dying on July 17th of 1887, and she is currently buried in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, I wonder so. why she's never talked about. Like, this is the, it's like she seems kind of important in, in this movement. Yeah. So it's strange why we've never heard of her before. Yeah. Really strange. Really, strange. that was weird. You cut out when you said that. Did I? Mm -hmm. Great. She's here hanging out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I I was shocked because when I was going through this, I'm like, she really like made an impact. Mm -hmm. How is this not more known? I'm and it's it's sad that we still live in a day and age where things like this are overlooked. Honestly, you don't really see much history on women making changes in you know, mental facilities until, like, the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. Almost like she had just missed the cut of, like, being in the history books or whatever. Right. But she's deserving of being in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's insane, honestly. The whole thing's crazy. Um, I would love yeah. to go to locations of mental hospitals um, for women. Yeah. And uh, do it right. You know, it's not... I feel like it, it comes down to a point where it's not necessarily about... The paranormal evidence, although that's fun to back up what we're experiencing and, and share that with the world, 
but it's also um, a way for the energies and the location to just sort of tell its story on its own. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's really it's dark times. It was, it was dark times. I got really emotional a couple of nights ago because Kat and I were doing research on this, and I, I I was just sitting there kind of meditating, and I was like, I wonder what it would have felt like to be locked up like that and you have no access out at all and you know in that time like no one will come get you you're stuck like you feel like you're going crazy just from being there um and I I told Kat I said you know I can kind of relate with all of the experiences we've had in film being women in film which is nobody's willing to sit down and, and even listen to you take the time of day Sort of like what I said in the, fe- you know, it's amazing, like, your gender, why it can cause such a problem. And it goes back to what I've, I've said over and over, which is, when I started Ghost Girl Diaries, I didn't mean to have a feminine feminist narrative. That wasn't my goal. That wasn't where I was, I wasn't like, yes, I'm going to do this feminist narrative. But until I realized so many doors, you know, nine out of ten doors were going to slam in my face, strictly because of my gender which it seems so ridiculous in 2021, 2020. Like, people want to say change is happening, change is coming. When? Let, let me know. I'm listening because I, I haven't seen it. You know, they're yep. saying they want change in film and they want change in paranormal. Adding one camera tech to ghost adventures doesn't count, okay? You know? Um, yep. And it is. It's, it's just sad because I can't imagine... Um, the torture, the torment they went through. Yeah, it really is, um, it's heavy. Mm-hmm. It's very heavy because I feel like just as women in general, when we go back and look at these records or go to a haunted location that has that history or worse, um, it really resonates with us. Mm-hmm. Really, because we carry that. Mm-hmm. We do. We carry that for generations, whether they were related to us or not, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. It was it was a way to get rid of women that you know people didn't want to deal with and that's just sad that's sad. well it's but almost like stepford wives type of thing they wanted you to become a stepford wife and like robotic and just listen and follow in your man's footsteps and the minute you even slightly stepped out of that shadow bye you're out yeah so anyway and i also think it hasn't been it still hasn't been done right from what i've seen on tv you know, like there's been opportunities for people to do these locations, right? And I still haven't seen that happen. It's okay. That's where we come in. I'm waiting till I'm dead. You know what I'm saying? I'm just sitting here waiting. Let me know when you're ready. <laughs> <sighs> no. We're so, going to do it right. Yeah, that's the T. That's that's one of our goals is to get in some women's facilities. Now, I want to take that and, and twist it for our last little segment here, which is we, we did locate and... Uh, I'm not going to, please don't say any names, Kat, because I know we have lists of of locations. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because it's not fair. We have lists of abandoned uh, mental asylums for women that were like in this time that we contacted and we were trying to get in to investigate. Now, some of them, I'm going to be honest, a lot of locations do not like what Ghost Adventures has done to their business or location, which is streaming it in a dark light of, de- of demon activity. And because of that, it has made getting in a paranormal location extremely hard. A lot of the locations Ghost Adventures has, has done will not let you into film. And it's because they feel like they didn't like the outcome of the episode. They don't want people to think there's demons and darkness, and that's always the end result. It makes me wonder if that's why they're doing more private locations now. It's because they don't have access to bigger locations, but it's also screwed all of us who are like smaller groups, other groups wanting to go in and film because they're like, no, 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 no. So we did find some other ones, and so so half of the locations that were asylums told us, no, we don't like what Ghost Adventures did to us in the limelight. The other half of the locations said Kat was doing the negotiating, and they literally told Kat, we don't want people to know the truth. We don't want people to know how, how bad it was here, because they always ask you, oh, well, what are you going to film? How are you going to film it? How are you going to tell the story? 
The story is going to be, as we always say, let the location speak for itself. We just want the history of the location. No, we're not going to do demons and stuff like that. And they, they freak out because they're like, we don't want people to know. We really don't want people to know how bad it was. And, and Kat and I were shocked by that. So yeah. I think some people don't even realize. I don't think some of the stuff that happened has even been released to the pu- public. I agree. And I think that's part of the problem, though. That, that you can't create change unless all the cards are on the table. Mm-hmm. Unless you know the truth of everything, no matter how dark it was. You know? I know those things should not have happened. Absolutely not. But, but who are you going to harm by, like, you know, it's not like it's an active asylum at this point. You know what I mean? So who are you going to yeah. harm by letting us go in and investigate and, and tell the history? It's true. Who are you harming? Like, are you afraid as the asylum owner you're going to be hunted down or something? You know what I mean? Mm, I don't know. That is a very interesting question, though. I almost wonder if maybe, like, spike in the activity. Maybe. You think? But I'm not that would sure. really be the only thing that would come to mind, you know? I don't know, because they were, they were kind of mean. Some of the locations were like, absolutely not. We do not want people to short. know what happened. The history is rough, and we don't want, we don't want the story told. Mm-hmm. Thank you for the follow, Spud Babe. Hey, Spud Babe. <laughs> I love that filter on oh. Snapchat. What, Aaron? The Pluto filter. Oh, was it Pluto? What? Who was it? The, the spud filter, like the potato filter. Oh, the, the the actual literal filter. Okay, I was like, like did I was like, was there a potato on the stream? I don't understand. <laughs> no, the I was like, oh great, like, we screwed oh, up potato. Streamlabs. It's gonna be fine. Sorry, I'm going off. It's fine. <laughs> well, anything else we want to add to it? I think we really touched on. I mean, there's so much more we could go off of. Right. There's so much, but there was one person that um someone had mentioned Pat. I can't remember um, who who it was, but there was a woman named Nellie Bly um, mm-hmm. who was a journalist in like the 1800s. Yes, and she was really interesting because she like pretended to be mentally ill to get like inside information. Right, she like that's admitted herself or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So right. that was just a quick one of what that. Yeah, that's a good one, but that's a whole nother stream too that we didn't want to divulge in. We were more interested in the asylum part because I just feel like people haven't really considered what these people went through like oh it's a haunted asylum do you know why it's haunted yeah people and especially women were tortured and murdered and raped and uh, you know what i mean like yeah i remember talking with crystal last night about how they have that american free um season of asylum and i got to like four seasons in or four seasons four episodes in Mm -hmm. and i couldn't finish i couldn't no, I couldn't. I was in pathing way too hard. Too realistic. It was, it was, oh my gosh! Like mm-hmm. you could feel the pain. You could feel the pain watching it happen on screen. I was just like, no. Mm-mm. Horrible. I know it's Horrible. it's scary to see it be reenacted. You know. It is, but looking forward to the you know future opportunities mm-hmm. to go go there and do it right. Do it I agree. Right. I agree. Mm-hmm. So last note that I sort of want to leave off with you guys is. Um, if you know anybody for our casting call, please send us the information to crystal at ghostgirldiaries.com. So re- real quick yeah, refresher. I'm looking for a sort of darky witch like Chanel was. I'm looking for a nerdy sort of researcher witchy type that goes by the book. And the third thing that I'm looking for is well, an engineer, a female engineer. So email me at crystal at ghostgirldiaries.com. Email me a short blurb, a couple headshots, which position you're interested in. If you know somebody on social media who's maybe a public figure or another YouTuber, send me their info, okay? Because I try to be involved and look as much as I can, but I think the engineer might be hard. So I hope I'm not setting up really high expectations for myself. So I'm hoping just the universe brings that right person towards me. You know what I mean? Um, I'd love to have somebody that could kind of take on Bill Chappell's designs and even Gary Galka's stuff and, and maybe even put a better twist on it, you know, with a with a female brain. Yeah. Oh, so amazing. It would be so cool. So anyway, mm-hmm. thank you guys so much for streaming with us today. We appreciate you being here. Please make sure you're following us on social media. Please make sure you're, uh, let's see, we're doing subscriptions on YouTube now. 
content's coming. I had a really busy week. I, first of all, I had a kidney infection. Yes, I'm better. Thank you for asking. I know a couple Ooh. of you asked. Um, yeah. Still going, but it's not as bad. Don't know how that happened, but it did. Um, and then the, and I was just really busy with meetings this week, honestly. Like, so, I mean, I wasn't even on social media hardly. It was a very productive, good week. So I hope you guys have an amazing weekend. Make sure you're following us on social media. This stream will be a podcast uploaded on Spotify, iTunes, all of the above tonight or tomorrow. So make sure you check it out. And as always, we will catch you guys next time. Next time. Bye, guys. Good night. Have a good Bye. weekend. Back, back, back from the dead.